when we want to figure out which parts of our identity we want to share first. Our jobs, our spouse, our place of origin, our interests. How do you like to introduce yourself first? Sometimes we don't choose. It's chosen for us by the person making the introduction. Growing up, I spent several weeks every summer in Laramore, North Dakota, which is just 40 miles or so outside of Grand Forks, which was the big town. Not so big. <laughs> Laramore itself is a very small town where pretty much everyone knows everyone. I remember one time I was there looking down Main Street and I made a bet with a person standing next to me that I would know the next person that walked down the street. And sure enough, it was my Uncle Olaf. <laughs> well, my youngest cousin, who is 18 months older than me, often got stuck dragging me around with him during those visits. His annoying little cousin. He'd be forced to take me to parties or card games with his friends or the Dairy Queen. And every time there was someone to introduce me to, he said the very same thing. This is my cousin Kirsten from California. <laughs> every time, no variation. I think he had it memorized. It was like a mantra. Then I had to be ready to explain right away that no, I don't hang out with movie stars. <laughs> and no, I don't surf every day or ever. <laughs> My identity during those introductions was wrapped up in who I was related to and where I was from. I kept thinking that there was so much more to me than those things. Couldn't Eric ever think of some other way to introduce me? That part of my identity, who I was related to and where I lived, just didn't seem to represent me as a whole person. Well, when we look at Matthew's Gospel tonight, I'm struck at how we seek to create identity for ourselves. How much our perceived appearance matters to us. We want to be identified as pious, as generous almsgivers, as people who pray and fast. We want to appear to be the right kind of people. But sometimes we get so caught up trying to appear that way that we don't pay attention to actually living that way. Or who we are trying to appear that way for. Or why. Jesus tells us that what others think about us, how others identify us, is not what matters. And it isn't necessarily truth. But what matters is truth. The rest of the world might think that we are saints, or they might believe that we are sinners. And they would be right. And wrong. Because we are both. The truth that matters most isn't about what we do. It is whose we are. In our baptism, we were anointed with oil. A cross was made on our foreheads. We were claimed as a beloved child of God. Marked by the cross of Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. Trace your finger on your forehead. Remember whose you are. Whose we are seeps into all aspects of our identity. Because of whose we are, we do spend time in prayer. 
Because of whose we are, we do give without holding back. Because of whose we are, we live responding to Jesus' love for us by loving and serving each other, all of our fellow human beings. Because of whose we are, we know that we belong wherever we are. Because of whose we are, we know that we are all connected. Because of whose we are, we know that no matter our failings, we are forgiven <coughs> and made whole. That cross on our forehead claims us as whose we are. Today, the ashes that will be placed over that very same cross do not show our piety, but our humility. They serve as a reminder of our mortality and that we are completely dependent on the one whose we are. When we receive those ashes tonight, we remember that we are nothing but dust on our own. But Christ has claimed us and breathes into that dust, giving us life. We belong to God. This is whose we are. This is who we are. Amen. <clears throat>